So hello class, welcome to our lecture for the Cash is King section of Anti-401. Um, in this video, I'm going to walk you through how to create financial models with an emphasis on the startup and modeling process for entrepreneurs. And I just wanted to note that financial modeling is going to be a key part of all business processes. So despite the fact that we're focusing on the startup process, this lesson on financial modeling will be useful in any career path you actually end up on. Now, because this is a senior commerce course, I am driving this content with concepts out of your introductory accounting and finance courses. If you do require additional context, I would advise you to first reach out to your group, then consult the additional web resources I've going, I'm going to link. And then if you're still stuck, you can bring your questions to either Chris or myself, and we'll be happy to help you. So in addition to this video, I've prepared a sample model you can use as an example and a starting point. And I want to note that I don't want you to use this as a template since plugging in the numbers and editing the spreadsheet isn't actually going to teach you anything of substance. You're going to need to actually construct the model, format it, enter the formulas, and that's the only way you're actually going to be able to learn how to model. So for this reason, I've actually locked my sheet with the password, but you'll still be able to view the cells and the formulas as a reference and use it as a reference and guiding point as you build your own models. Now, I'd also like to note I've omitted some key startup costs since I want you to be able to come up with them on your own. So you're not just going to be able to copy me. Um, and despite having said all this, you're still going to have me as a resource. So don't be afraid to shoot me an email if you have any questions and I'll walk you through the process. But I'm not going to do the work for you. And that's what providing you a template essentially does. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I want to start by making a distinction between financial modeling and basic pricing analysis. Uh, this figure here demonstrates the most basic of financial analysis, which is pricing and break-even, and is very similar to what we typically do in a lot of our NT courses, and this is also what you would have done in your first feasibility project. So you see you kind of have understanding of a minimum price, so that we can generate profit off of this, what's our break-even point, are our margins good enough, and then is someone actually going to pay for our uh, product at this price point? So you get that kind of initial market validation. But that's not really financial modeling. This is just like the very bare bones service level, you know, start of financial modeling in this break even part. Um, and what we're actually going to do is look at something that's more advanced in our proper financial modeling, which actually kind of almost borders onto the uh, finance for entrepreneurs course, which is uh, NT473. Not entirely a lot of overlap, but in any case, this is definitely going to help you in some of those courses as well as some other business analytics courses. Um, so let's talk about financial modeling. So what is financial modeling actually, and how does it differ from the break-even uh, analysis that we actually do in other classes? So what this exercise is actually going to do is to demonstrate to you how to forecast your cash flows over a particular period, manage your startup costs, such as capital expenditures, understand your required startup capital, predict your return on investment, and show you how to run a basic valuation for your business. So each of these components are vital in making a nuanced feasibility analysis of your business idea because each component has a certain emphasis that's going to change the answer of whether your business is feasible or not. So for example, even if a business can generate revenues and positive cash flows, if you can't afford the startup costs, then you'll never get off the ground. So it doesn't matter if you can generate those revenues and positive cash flows. Now, because you do have this proven kind of business validation, this might mean you can appeal to investors but you also all have to understand what sort of return on investment you can offer them. If there are better deals for them to invest in, whether they're com your competitive entrepreneurs, whether they're traditional investment portfolios and banks, there are other opportunities to invest in and limited amount of investors to actually capture. And so making sure that you're actually promising them the right deal, understanding what you're actually promising them is going to be important. And this is not only for external investors, but it's also true for yourself. Think, for example, if you're working a, a corporate job and you're thinking about starting your own business, you need to understand what the return on investment is and whether it's actually going to be worth your time, whether or not you're actually going to be able to make significant money, meet your threshold for you to actually make such a leap. Um, maybe you actually have to choose between different businesses. You know, you're working on one currently, you're thinking about starting another one. You want to know which one you want to divert your time to. Well, this modeling is actually going to be able to kind of give you a starting point on some of those questions. So I think it's also extremely important to know how much your business should be worth 
if you're to find yourself in a situation where you're pitching to somebody like the dragons or other angel investors and making sure that you aren't up to lunch with your numbers there's a huge emphasis in entrepreneurship studies and an nte to focus on pitching and financial modeling is one of the most key areas for it if somebody believes in your idea but you have no financial backing or no understanding of where you're going to be able to generate those revenues and your modeling is completely out to lunch well, chances are you're not going to get that investor no matter how much they like your idea. I also want to emphasize that the fact that many of these deals that you see in Dragon's Den actually fall through because entrepreneurs have modeled their businesses incorrectly or are misrepresenting them in their pitches. So not only is adequate research important, but so is modesty. So while it's true that the general rule in business is to under-promise and over-deliver, because you're actually pitching in this scenario, I think you need to find a fine line where you have a good balance between showing that your business idea is actually appealing and then also being modest and realistic about your numbers. Having said that, I think if you're in doubt, you should always kind of round down. In terms of the content I'm going to show you, I'm going to be using the best practices out of the Global Corporate Finance Society. So these are best practices that you'll be marked on as well. So note that all inputs of your model should be coded blue, while all calculations should be coded black. You should also use the accounting format for all your numbers. This is because the parentheses function is preferred over the negative signs, which you get with the currency function or currency format. Note that you should always use the sum function for any numbers grouped together and only click on individual cells using the plus and minus symbols when there are no other cells referenced adjacent to it. You will also generally specify in your itemization when you're subtracting a value as less and then code the value to actually be negative right in the cell. Then to carry out the operation of actually lessing this from your totals, you simply sum all your values. Now you generally want to refrain from using subtraction unless it is part of an operation that does not have these itemized values, uh, such as finding the percent change or the deltas between two values, so from one year to the next. Now having said that, it is also acceptable by Global Corporate Finance Society standards to not specify when you're lessing a value, in which case you have to use subtraction, but it's often going to make it more difficult for a financial statement to actually stand without having the Excel spreadsheet because you can't see what the calculations are in the formula bar. Um, so just glancing at it on the paper and you're trying to balance things, it doesn't really make sense. For example, if you put it into a PDF. Um, and so these standards are intended to make your financial statements really ready, a presentation ready in a static format, whether or not you're going to be putting that into PDF or PowerPoint. And so we're going to be pretty lean on these standards, but I want you to make a very good attempt to get to your full marks. Um, if there's tons of glaring errors and you, you know, didn't even attempt to follow these standards, then uh, expect to lose some marks in those areas. I'd also like to note that the Global for Corporate Finance Society standards are also used by the International Institute of Business Analytics, um, which is the body that certifies business analyst professionals, so the CBAP certification. And this is covered in depth by the Corporate Finance Institute's Certification for Financial Modeling and Valuation Analysts. So that's a certification I actually hold. And I'd like to recommend you to the CFI's free resources. They're quite useful, and I'd actually recommend a lot of their articles and blog posts as a starting point to gain some additional context if you find some of these concepts a little challenging at first. So now that I've told you about the what and the why, let's move forward on some technical concepts. I'll be first showing you some key definitions and metrics, and then describing what should go into a good assumption. We'll then have a quick review of the three different financial statements. I'll describe how supporting schedules are going to play into this model. And then I'm going to discuss to you what the value of a discounted cash flow is. So there are two types of metrics we need to focus on. I'm going to discuss both customer-driven metrics and financial metrics here, providing a few definitions, and then I'm going to get into some formulas. An active customer is a person or organization who's made a purchase within the last calendar year, or within a set trailing period. And this set period is actually going to vary by the type of business, by your type of industry. And whatever this period of time is determined to be is actually also known as the customer's lifetime. Similarly, your churn is the number of customers you lose per year. For example, customers who don't return. And this also varies greatly by industry. For example, car dealership is probably going to have fewer active customers with a larger list of customers overall accompanied by a higher churn rate. Whereas a hair salon would have a much higher number of active customers, a smaller overall customer list, and a lower churn rate. 
So service businesses are more likely to have a low churn rate, as a churn rate is indicative of changing market tastes or service or an increase in competitors. It's typically going to be quite stagnant and consistent year to year. Um, and goods with higher expenses typically will have the highest churn rates because large expenditures do not happen as frequently. I also want to talk about total addressable market. So that's the total amount of people that would be your total customers. So the customer lists I was discussing earlier, essentially any of your potential niche, these are your target customers. So I also want to mention the net promoter score. This is a quantitative metric. It's obtained through surveys and it measures how frequently a customer is going to recommend your business to somebody else, whether that's a family, a friend, somebody like that. And so if you're going to build any kind of incentive marketing, offering discounts, um, sales premiums, things like that, that are going to be part of your customer projections and your growth model, I want you to include some primary research on this, calculate your net promoter score, and then include that within your model. So the last definition I'm going to dive into on this slide before I break down some of these formulas is the gross merchandise value. And this is simply the value of everything you've sold in your current period. And this is pretty much the exact same thing as your gross revenue, but it's the preferred term for e-commerce startups. And as we know, e-commerce is a very popular type of business model for uh, entrepreneurs. So if you're going to be using an e-commerce business model, I'd recommend you use the gross merchandise value instead of gross revenue. So with that, let's dive into some of our formulas. So your average order value is going to play a big part in understanding customer behavior. So if you recall the car dealership, customers are going to have a higher order value. So reaching certain revenue milestones may be easier. Whereas if you have something like a dollar store, for example, it's going to take significantly longer to pay for the same type of capital expenses, such as a building. And so this is simply measured by revenue divided by your total number of orders. The next definition I'm going to focus on is the lifetime value, which is the expected revenue you can generate from a single customer. So um, I'm going to give you an example for this. If I were to buy a set of appliances for my new home uh, from a company, say Samsung, it's unlikely that Samsung is actually going to see me as a return customer within the next set customer lifetime. Um, so maybe that's they set that as one year as a customer lifetime. But because by the time those appliances are going to break down, I might purchase from another brand such as LG or GE instead. So understanding customer lifetime value, your turn rate, all this is a key consideration of the customer acquisition cost, which I'm going to talk about next. You don't want to spend all this money on getting your customers through the door, have them make a one-time purchase, kind of break even, maybe even lose money. And then because they don't contribute a lot to your revenue and they just never purchase from you again, maybe that marketing strategy isn't actually effective or you're not seeing the return on investment you think you are. Um, and so this is absolutely the power of using this lifetime value metric. It's going to lead you to make decisions about how to reward the loyal customers through loyalty programs. And this is actually how um, companies such as Starbucks calculate how to set up their STARS program or um, companies like HBC and President's Choice set up their points programs. And so this is simply calculated by the calculating the multiplying the average customer lifetime by the average customer set spend by a percent of gross profit on average. So next is the ARPU metric, which is very similar to the lifetime value metric, but it's going to look at things from a more macro perspective. So as you can see, your ARPU metric is pretty straightforward. You're just going to calculate your total revenue divided by your total customers over a set period of time. And so I'd say you could actually use this in place of your lifetime value metric, um, although it's a bit of a gross oversimplification, um, but just use whatever you're most comfortable with and what makes sense to you. So next we have the customer acquisition cost, which represents pretty much exactly what it sounds like. So the amount of marketing spent on a customer to obtain a customer. This essentially measures how effective your marketing is. And because entrepreneurs and startups are always looking for ways to bootstrap, you juggle limited your capital, you want to measure your marketing and measure its return on investment to make sure whether or not it's actually giving you what you need. I find that people like to project significant social media growth and just kind of assume that for paying for something like Google ads or Facebook marketing, you're going to have this major customer growth. And so while this does occasionally happen, the average click through rate for social media ads can range from anywhere from one to 20%. And sometimes they can have really astronomical costs. So if you sit down and calculate the cost of customer acquisition, you might be surprised at the return on investment of your chosen, chosen marketing strategy. And I think you should adjust your numbers and projections accordingly 
based on what that calculation gives you. Now next is the sell through rate. It's going to measure of your use of inventory. So again, when you're thinking of startups, you need to consider the cost impact of your inventory, whether you're producing or you're reselling. This sort of metric is the financial quantification of your operations supply chain management. Um, and so not something I want you to get distracted on, but it is something you should use to validate your numbers. So between a quick production schedule, the customers you have, the related costs, how much inventory will you actually have to, on hand to tie up your cash? And how much money will be tied up between when your customers order and when they actually pay? Is this actually going to be feasible? You can't have super tight timelines and expect a perfect conversion between revenue through your cogs and inventory because there's going to be additional costs you have to consider. And this sort of realism is something we want you to walk away with at the end of this feasibility analysis, really understanding the dynamics of a financial model and the ends to ends of the business because the financials start at one end and go all the way downstream from orders to collections. The next these formulas for uh, gross profit should be pretty familiar to you at this point in your academic career. I'm going to include them just for your reference. So here's gross profit. Here's gross profit margin. And then lastly, the enterprise value is going to be your total value of the business. This can be done with corporations by evaluating the share price. And in many private companies, the actual inverse of this is how you calculate your share price. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to use the bound sheet method of enterprise value. And so this value is going to be your shareholders' equity plus the debts outstanding minus the cash on hand. And to wrap your head around this, you can kind of imagine the following scenario to understand the logic. You think about when a company goes bankrupt and they liquidate, their cash goes to their debts, and their remaining debts plus their equity is their value. Um, so this logic is kind of be applied even when a business isn't going bankrupt, or we're simply looking to obtain its you know, general value. So with all these definitions and calculations out of the way, let's turn to the assumptions in our model. So without any inputs, we can have all the formulas we want all day and every day, but that's going to be no use because we have nothing to actually plug in. And so here's a screen cap from Numbio. It's a great resource for kind of finding the initial costs of living in different countries and different cities. But unfortunately, it's in the public domain, which means anyone can edit it. Also means it's not a reliable resource. I don't want you to cite things like this. Making business decisions off of Wikipedia is a surefire way to lose investor confidence. And likewise, using these sorts of sources for your cost and assumptions isn't going to cut it for your feasibility assignment. Now compare this to this source from the Alberta government. Notice that it cites various journals for each of its sections. These are the types of citations we are looking for. And based on both feasibility analysis number one and number two, you should have a good basis for how to do primary and secondary research. You've also had a session with our librarian Zara, and so using those library resources and the various databases, that's going to be required for putting the inputs into your model. Now, having said that, you can and are encouraged to use real listings. Um, if there's a building or Emax you want to purchase, cite that and include it in your appendices. Likewise, for Kijiji or any kind of other marketplace, anything else you can find online, just be aware of different scams, be aware of false advertisements, and make sure you're comparing apples to apples. A quick Google search and kind of the first item that pops up might not really cut it. And we're really going to be validating your assumptions and making sure your costs are appropriate. Um, so remember to cite everything, provide sufficient explanations, and back up your assumptions. And also, if a deal is too good to be true, it likely is. So if you happen to find something that's way under market value, generally you shouldn't cite that in your model. You should kind of cite the going market rate or the fair market value. So next we have capital expenditures versus operating expenses. So capital expenses are going to include things like buildings, machinery, patents, other large capital expenses. These are going to be addressed in your supporting schedules. And I want you to focus on your operating expenses, which are going to be related to your standard operations, such as rent, equipment, inventory costs, marketing, payroll, insurance, R&D, whatever else. So you're going to grow your operating expenses based on an inflation rate in your model as they change over time. Generally, the inflation rate for most financial models within Canada is about 2%. Uh, and you're going to model these costs as growing by inflation within your SG&A costs and your COGS. So speaking of growth and inflation and things like that, we're actually going to have a growth rate for your customers as well. And I want you to calculate a churn rate and subtract them from your total number of customers. This not only keeps things dynamic, but it also makes things much more realistic because instead of having linear growth now, you're actually going to have a little bit more stagnated um, growth, which you have seen in all operations and management and strategy textbooks 
Uh, it's not a straight line. It's going to have some plateaus and different dips and different stages as you kind of grow, mature, um, etc. And so this realistic growth rate compounded with the considerations of the inflations within your costs, as mentioned prior, they're going to really help set your product price. And then from there, you're going to be able to determine your revenue, which leads us to our review of the financial statement. So the first financial statement we're going to review is the income statement. As a reminder, this is what an income statement kind of looks like. As mentioned, you want to calculate your revenue based off your changing number of customers, turned and all, with an inflation inclusive box of goods sold. Calculate your gross profit and gross margin off of that, then factor in your inflation rate inclusive uh, SGNA. So calculate your EBITDA once you've done that. You can format the rest of your income statement, but you're not going to fill out the rest. So you're going to return to complete it once you've done the other statements. Um, I've listed the requirements here, but again, you can reference my sample for further guidance, but it's not going to be entirely comprehensive of everything you need to do because each business is going to have different kind of moving, changing costs. So next is the balance sheet. Make sure to capture your relevant assets and liabilities. Most of this is pretty straightforward, so I'll remind you to make sure things are going to balance. As a reminder, this is what a balance sheet kind of looks like. Um, for your inventory calculation, I want you to find something that makes sense in terms of inventory days. For AR days, you can use something between net 15 and net 60 terms. For AP days, please use something between net 30 and net 90 terms. And as a reminder, for inventory, AR, and AP, you need to multiply the total cost of goods sold or your total revenue by your number of days and then divide by the 365 days in a year to get your actual calculation. I also want to give a quick reminder of what the balance sheet commonly contains and kind of looks like. Uh, you notice the T-table structure in the last slide. This doesn't actually comply with the Global Corporate Finance Society's modeling standards, but it is a very nice visual visualization of how assets and liabilities have to balance out. So what are supporting schedules? Supporting schedules detail a period of time and how your capital expenditures and debt is going to be depreciated, paid, etc. So you need a starting balance and an ending balance with the changes in the different kind of cash flows in between. So as a reminder, capital assets include things like buildings, machineries, patents, and other large capital expenses. And these are going to be depreciated or amortized over their lifetime. For our financial models, you're going to use depreciation amortization costs starting in the second year. The counting rules around this are kind of complex, but um, just as a simplification, you can't capitalize something in the same fiscal year that you purchased it. So at this time, you should also determine if you need to have debt financing, such as a loan. This is especially true if you have high cash expenditures, um, and I want you to include a debt schedule, including a fixed interest rate and a deadline for the repayment, including the principal amount and the payment each year. Essentially, you can treat this debt kind of like a mortgage, uh, less the compounding interest. Uh, I'm not going to be too picky about how you calculate your debt schedule. Just make sure it kind of makes sense. It's realistic and you're clear on what you're doing. So explain what formula or logic you're actually using so we can follow along. So once you have all this put together, you can create the statement of cash flows. And this is going to be how you balance your cash. So as a reminder, you're going to need to calculate the details and the deltas of your inventory, AP, AR, equity, and debt which includes the current year values minus the past year's values. And the last notation prescribed by GCFS is going to be important here. Um, and when you review my sample, you're gonna see why this formatting is actually preferred. So once you have these values computed, you're gonna be able to discount them. And here's a reminder of what a basic cash flow statement includes and kind of looks like. So in terms of the requirements, you're going to want to calculate the net present value of all the discounted cash flows taking the earnings before interest and tax and the values from your supporting schedules in the balance sheet. You're gonna take your EBIT, less your taxes and CapEx, plus your depreciation, less the changes in working capital, and this is going to give you your unlevered free cash flows, which you can run your NPV on. So the rate for your NPV is your hurdle rate, the minimum percentage of return you want to see at the end of your five years of business. Um, you should then use a low EBITDA multiple for your terminal value, which is something that's going to be less than one, and calculate the net present value for your business at that terminal time. So summing the two gives you an enterprise value, and then when you compare this to the other various ratios I noted in the key metrics, such as enterprise value to revenue, enterprise value to EBIT, 
EV to EBITDA. You're going to see how effective your business actually is at leveraging revenues and turning them to sustainable profits. And this is how a lot of others are actually going to validate your business. So um, oftentimes, probably what some of those dragons are actually scribbling down on their notepads after probing you with some questions. Once you gather the total of all your information, you can graph it, plot it, and present it. So be smart, don't put graphs in that don't add value for the sake of adding graphs, but maybe you can actually demonstrate how great of an investment your company actually is. Um, for example, as you can see from this source out of Bloomberg, there's a low uh, EV to EBITDA companies actually perform extremely well, especially in comparison to S&P 500 companies. And so this is the power of a strong financial model in projecting and forecasting your cash flows all the way through your financial statements. You can present a graph like this. You're really going to have a much higher chance of making your pitch effective, understanding what goes in and out of your business, and making sure you're actually going to be running your business properly. So to tie this all back together, this is a sort of presentation that's going to be great at demonstrating the feasibility as well, whether or not the business is viable, attractive, you're going to be able to sustain your business. And this is ultimately kind of what a pitch is anyways, proving to somebody that your idea is indeed feasible. So I hope you found this lecture useful in getting you started on your feasibility analysis. Um, we went through a lot of information, so I encourage you to give this a second pass, especially if you haven't taken notes along the way. Review my sample model and consider some of these guiding questions. So would you invest in the business I modeled in my sample? Why or why not? Is my required capital feasible or realistic? And could I convince you to loan me the $450,000? As you go through your own feasibility analysis, and after you've completed your own model, you should be reviewing these questions and remember to describe your assumptions, justify their validation, and of course, cite your assumptions as always. If you have any questions, I'm going to be available at the live lecture that's upcoming Tuesday in class. And as well, I'm going to be consistently available by email. And you'll have Chris to lean into for support as well. So if you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to reach out and ask us with any of your questions. Best of luck with your feasibility analysis. I look forward to seeing some upstanding models.